Hey, welcome to week two of our You, Me, and We series. Now today, we're gonna talk a lot specifically about marriage. Last week, we talked to singles, talked to widows, and there's going to be a specific emphasis for those of you who are single, but uh, I just want you to kind of be uh, prepared for this as we walk through today. Now, I'm so excited uh, because uh, from this point on, these next three weeks, I don't have to preach for myself. So I get to preach with Jolene today. So I'm very, very excited about that. Hey everybody, I'm Jolene Fisher. I'm the women's ministry lead here. And I've been married to my husband, Adam Fisher, sitting right here in the front row for 25 years. He is my eighth grade sweetheart. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> and we have two beautiful girls, Allie and Sydney. Now today, uh, as we focus, I wanna kinda uh, prep your hearts just a little bit. Um, I need you, if, especially if you are married, uh, to listen for yourself. I don't want you to listen for your spouse. They're here to listen for themselves. So the idea is not, Lord, please let them hear. Please let him hear. Let, please let her hear uh, because I don't need any more marriage counseling and you don't need to go through that as well. God has you here for a reason. So listen through that lens. God, what do you want me to hear? Whether you're single, whether you're married, you know, to not listen for somebody else, but listen for you. Okay, the second thing I want to kind of give you a caveat is that we only have this amount of time to cover something that's like this. So you might hear something that uh, hits you the wrong way, that uh, pricks maybe a little bit deeper. And, and instead of doing what our culture has taught us, which is just to get mad, upset, to cancel, to dismiss, engage in a conversation. Uh, ask clarifying questions. Hey, I heard you say this, or did you mean this, or it struck me this way, just, just as again, we, we don't have a chance to unpack everything that we're talking about. And so with that kind of uh, uh, laid out, I want Jolene to kind of kick us off as we, as we start today. Yes, so ladies, this question is for you. How many of you maybe occasionally, or perhaps even often, battle with the need to take control in your marriage? Anybody? Show Anybody of hands. can relate to okay. that? A few yeah. people here and there. Okay, uh, men, uh, although you might uh, be uh, driven, might be super excited about your work, about your hobbies, how many of you can admit from time to time that you might be maybe a little too easygoing, maybe a little bit passive when it comes to your relationship with your wife or even with your kids? Raise your hands. Okay, ladies, if you're sitting by a passive husband, raise his hand for him. You know, um, you, can, you can do that as well. So a common issue, and I understand whenever you talk generalities, there's that, well, that doesn't apply to me. So just again, hear it as what does apply to you. But a common issue that we see today that hinders God's design for marriage is a passive husband and a controlling wife. And it's not something that's just revealed itself today. It's actually been going on for quite a long time. In fact, we're going to look at a very obscure marriage in our Bibles. King Ahab and Jezebel are going to give us an example of kind of what this look like, looks, looks like. So let, let me give you some context. King Ahab was the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel, and he ruled for about 20 years. He ruled in 875 to 855 BC. Now, his gift was he was a great military leader. He was a great uh, political leader. He, he loved to drive. He loved to pour himself into those environments. But as you're going to see, he was very passive when it came to his maritable relationship with Jezebel. God actually had given him an opportunity to lead the nation of Israel towards the things of God, but instead he was more influenced and guided by his wife. But it wasn't his wife to blame, it's him to blame because of his passivity. In fact, if there's not more of an indicting scripture on someone, how about this one from 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25? No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did, under the influence of his wife, Jezebel. And so we have this power dynamic that takes place in so many marriages, and Ahab represents the passive husband. Now, let me be clear. When I say passive husband, I'm not talking about a husband who may be introverted or more withdrawn. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about passive. To be passive means to accept or allow outcomes without an active response or resistance. Just to accept things for what they do. There's no active activity. There's no response. You know, and so we find ourselves being passive. 
And so this mostly, as we've seen, uh, can take place in a marriage and even into the home. Uh, there can be a, a tendency to abdicate this uh, responsibility when it's come to the home to our wives. And it's not the first time, and Ahab wasn't the first time. In fact, the first time we need to read about this goes back to the Garden of Eden. If you go back to the garden, you see that here's the serpent that is talking to Eve and says, hey, let me tell you about what God really said in this forbidden fruit, and I want you to notice what Eve does, but I want you to notice what Adam doesn't do. And so it says this, that the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious, so she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Now, don't miss this. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Like, what the heck, Adam? Not, not you, Adam. You know, the different Adam. You know, like, what do you mean? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you stand up and say, hey, hon, this is not what God wants us to do. In fact, if you want to look chronologically at the Bible, you will see that God told Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before Eve was even created. So either God had a conversation with Eve later, or Adam is the one that told Eve, hey, we're not supposed to do this. Eve knows that this is not to be true, but Adam was the one who was supposed to say, let's not do this. And to show you the responsibility is on Adam, not on Eve, look what it says in the curse of Genesis 3.17. And to the man he said, since you, Adam, listened to your wife, this is on you. Since you listened, you were passive with your wife and ate from the tree of whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. The ground is cursed because of you. All your life you'll struggle to scratch a living from it. Uh, now this is important. Those of you who are single and in the dating kind of sphere of life, I, I want to kind of give you just a little heads up. If you fe feel like you found the one and the reason that that person is the one is because when you want to do things, they always want to do what you want to do. When you want to go eat, they always want to eat what you want to eat. You're just like, and we never fight. This is like the perfect relationship. Not sure what everybody else found, but I finally found the one. Here's what I can tell you. When I'm in a premarital conversation and I ask the question, how do you deal with conflict? And one or both of them look at me and say, well, actually, we never fight. I'm like, alarm, alarm, alarm. All you told me is that at least one person in this relationship is passive. And the very thing that you love in that dating relationship will be the thing that will drive you insane in a marriage. Because you're like, I love, I love, I love, but then oh, now we're married. And like, I want them to be a little bit more engaged, a little bit more connective, a little bit more proactive, and they're not. Well, you could have seen that in the dating relationship, if that makes sense. So just as a little, little tidbit. So let me just give you some, circum some, some characteristics of a passive husband, just really quickly. Uh, this, and just evaluate again through your own lens and your own eyes, because I've, I've felt this at times in my own relationship as well. So first would be an unwillingness to engage relations, relationally beyond the physical. Not met many men who are, who, are, who, are, who are unengaged when it comes to the physical side of the relationship. But when it comes to the spiritual and emotional, it can feel awkward. It feels unfamiliar. It feels uncomfortable. And oftentimes I'll, I'll talk to men and they'll say, well, I've never really seen it, never really modeled, and it just feels like it's just outside of my understanding or bandwidth. And yet, even though it sounds like a good reason, we don't apply it, men, when it comes to the things that we are passionate about. When it comes to our work or our hobbies, you are not an expert from day one. And yet something was inside you that drove you to become better, to learn, to grow, even when you didn't know those things, can we apply that same principle when it comes to our marriages? To do what's uncomfortable and unfamiliar in order for the marriage to actually thrive and grow the way God intended. Second characteristic would be an avoidance of conflict, right? Happy wife, happy life. So I never want to say anything that uh, may ruffle the feathers. It's just not worth it. You know, I'm tired of having the arguments, whatever that may be. But here's what happens. If you don't work in and through the conflict, if you avoid conflict, it still is something that's unsettling in you that will come out somewhere else. It'll be an explosion. It'll be something else that'll happen. And so learning how to enter into healthy conflict, not avoidance of will actually move you from passive to active, which then leads to number three, an overly dependent or reliance on the wife for decisions, especially when it comes to the home or the kids. 
And so you're like, whew, well, she's passionate about this. She's excited about this. I'm just gonna let her you know, kind of take the lead, which sounds great at first, but the problem is over time, you become more and more and more passive, and you might find yourself thinking, why is she nagging me so much? Could it be the nags never started out of nags? She's just wanting you to engage because you're passive in the relationship with the kids, with the things in the house, but you've got so comfortable, you got so comfortable on relying on her to lead and make all the decisions that now you're actually looking at her saying, well, why is she nagging me? Well, it could not be a nag. It actually just is a cry for, please be involved. Please jump into what's going on. So if any of this is ringing true at any point, you know, uh, uh, any aspect of this, you know, I, I want you just to kind of process through what does that mean? So Jolene, what do you think? Wow, I think there's a lot of truth bombs there for the men. But ladies, I got a lot of truth for you coming up, so buckle up, because we're gonna be talking about Queen Jezebel, the evil queen, and her control, rule, and domination over her husband, King Ahab. And so, our built into our DNA was this need to control our husbands. So, you know, Queen Jezebel, we can say, yeah, she was mean, she was evil. There's a reason why she was the way she was. But it goes beyond that, because I could say a lot of us in here are nice women. I'm a nice woman, but still, I want to control my husband. And so this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We go all the way back, like we, you were saying, that we go where Eve, you know, she'd listened to Satan, and they had decided to eat the forbidden fruit, and now they're naked and ashamed in the garden, and God comes to them in Genesis 3.16 and says to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. So from the time we were born, ladies, we have had to fight against this curse. God's curse on Eve has everything to do with relationships and family life. So not only would we experience the pain of childbirth from then on out, we would now experience that strain in our marriage because we want to control our husband or we're, we're kind of working against ourselves Rather than experience love and comfort from Adam, we're now trying to control him. And I think it's funny saying the name Adam because that's my husband's name. Um, but here in this case, I really relate to Eve because just like Eve, if I'm gonna be honest, I do this all the time. And we're gonna talk about what does it mean to be a controlling wife by looking at 1 Kings 21, five through seven to just get our example going here. So Queen Jezebel says, what's the matter? What made you so, so upset that you're not eating? And, he, and King Ahab says, I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused. And Jezebel says, well, are you the king of Israel or not? Get up and eat something and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. So there are three things in this passage that really stand out as characteristics of a controlling wife. Number one, Jezebel belittled her husband and she showed contempt through her words. Now, according to the Gottman Institute and their decades of research on couples and their com negative communication styles, it can lead to these, these four things that they came up with are called the four horsemen. And these can lead to relationship breakdown and failure. The four horsemen refer to the four horsemen of the apocalypse from Revelation, signaling end times, right? So these four horsemen include criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. Well, the Gottman researchers say that it is contempt that is the number one greatest predictor of relationship failure. So let's, let's camp there a little bit and talk about what contempt is and what that looks like. Contempt is an expression of superiority over someone. So how could that come out, right? It comes out as sarcasm, name calling. If you're a humorous person, you might be more like the hostile type humor in this case. You might mock your wife or your husband um, eye-rolling, distrust, suspicion. And if I'm gonna be honest, I've done the name-calling thing. I've done the eye-rolling. I've done the distrusting. You know, I, I can go down this list and look to myself for all these reasons that I, I can look toward. Oh, boy. I can use a little help in that re region. I don't know about you ladies. How about you? Anyone can relate to that? All right. Nobody? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, number two is that she pressures him to do something he doesn't want to do. She says, get up and eat and don't worry. Well, I have the perfect, perfect example here of a controlling wife and a passive husband in my own marriage. 
Well, two years into our marriage, we were headed down to Cabo. It was our second honeymoon. We were really excited to get a free stay. My parents had given us a week at their condo, and we were like, yes, anything for free at 25 years old and two years into marriage, we'll take it. So we get on the cheap bus down to the timeshare that we were staying at, and it was, you know, timeshare person after timeshare person on the bus strategically placed to offer free things to people like us who were... <laughs> for the first time going to Cabo and had no idea what to expect. They're like, you want free snorkeling, you want free massage, you want free this, 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 and this. Then come to a timeshare presentation. We're like, sign us up, let's do it. <laughs> and so two days into our vacation, we're spending a half a day at this other resort and four hours into that presentation, we'd been saying, no, 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 <laughs> we're not doing this. Well, the, the junior manager guy gets shooed aside by the other manager, the big dog. He's like, step aside, I've got them. Of course, we were just like sitting ducks at that age. And he's like, I'm gonna offer you guys a full day out on a boat and you're gonna get a free, you know, the captain for free and the whole day you go fishing. That's what you do in Cabo. So we're like, wow, that sounds great. He's like, but I'm gonna give you a few more minutes just to make this decision. So he walks away and we're like, well, it's a definite no because we don't have the money. Well, the guy comes back and he sits down and he's like, so what did you decide? And I'm like, we're gonna do it. <laughs> And Adam's like, what? <laughs> he, although he didn't say that. And uh, that is how we ended up with a 40-year commitment to a timeshare. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Needless to say, the rest of that vacation wasn't so pleasant for me. <laughs> All right. Number three, Jezebel, in this example, she takes over. She says, I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. So what does this look like from a wife to a husband? This may mean that she dictates her spouse's schedule or what he's gonna wear. She might even take over the finances completely so that he can't see what she's spending her money on. Or she makes big decisions without his help. Or rather than communicating about something, she might assume her husband just can't do the job right, so she's gonna do it anyways, and she oversteps and tries to solve the problem herself. So if this is the issue, and again, you might be the one that says, well, I'm actually more the controller and she's more the passive, again, contextualize, listen for you. But if this is the issue, if this is some of the common issues in marriage and we find that, then what does God have to say about this? In other words, how does God want us to respond if this is a pattern that is easy for us to walk into, into a relationship, or to continue to exhibit in our current relationship? I want to start in Ephesians 5.21, because as it talks about this marriage relationships, it starts with this word that as Americans we love, submit. You know, submit to one another is how the whole passage starts. Uh, out of reverence for Christ. So what Paul is writing says, we have, a, we have a design that Jesus wants us to submit to one another. Now, to submit does not mean Lord over, does not demanding. To submit literally means a willingness to place oneself under the leadership or headship of another. So it's a choice that you get to make to say, I'm going to submit. So like in a marriage relationship, uh, you'll see this play out all the time. Like, well, hey, somebody needs to, maybe our language is, be the point person. Who's going to be the point person for the finances? Who's going to be the point person for this aspect of the house? Who's going to be a point person for this? Doesn't mean you're not a team. Doesn't mean that uh, uh, one is lording over the other, but somebody is taking the point, the lead. The other person is willingly choosing to place themselves underneath that person. That's what it looks like to submit to one another. But the driver is not about the other person. The driver is out of our reverence, respect, submission to Jesus. That's where that comes from, which we'll unpack that in just a second. So how does that look like in the, in the marriage? Yes, so in the marriage for the wife, our wife, the wives are called to submit and respect, like you just said, but from Ephesians 55, or 5, 22 through 24, we, we hear, wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do the Lord. For the husband is ahead of the wife as Christ is ahead of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And in verse 33, However, each one of you must also love your wife, his wife, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So for the wives, there are two things that stand out to me here, that we must not only submit to our husbands, but also respect them. So let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about what submission does not mean. Submission does not mean inequality, okay? Submission means to voluntarily give your husband the place of honor, 
Just as your husband places himself under God, the wife is now placing herself under God and the husband. I have a great example of this. We were in Honduras in November with a bunch of ladies we took there from the church, and we met a guy down there named Jorge. He was our guide. He was great. He just showed us everything. It was a wonderful pastor. Well, at the end of our stay, I was like, hey, Jorge, how did you meet your wife? And he's like, well, actually, that's kind of a funny story. And he said, I was preaching when I was younger, and this girl walks in and was listening to my sermon, and I was talking about how Eve was made out of Adam. And he was explaining how Eve wasn't made out of Adam's head so that she would be head over Adam, and Eve wasn't made out of Adam's foot so she would be under Adam's foot, but that Eve was made from Adam's ribs so that they would walk side by side in all that they did in service to Christ. And I just loved that example. Obviously, she loved it too, enough that they ended up... (laughs) having a dating relationship and then getting married. But all you single guys are taking notes. Here we go. (laughs) So I need to do. Yeah, right. Walking side by side is as equals, yet keeping in mind that we each have a role to play in our marriage as husband and wife. We're called to different things. Like the man is called to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and the wife is called to give her husband the authority in the household. This is why it's important to be equally yoked so that, like just as Dan had talked about last week, just you are now speaking the same language, you're on the same page, and you understand each other's roles. Secondly, in Ephesians 5.33, we're called to respect our husbands. So respect means to hold in high esteem. Respect for husbands is love. I'll say that again. Respect for husbands is love to them. Can I get an amen, guys? Amen. (laughs) Treat him with respect only, God doesn't say treat him with respect only when you feel like it Mm. or when it's easy to do it. In the times when it's hard to show respect, we need to look to ourselves for how we can control ourselves. So things like controlling your tongue, controlling your, your heart, controlling your actions and your thoughts. In Romans 12, 18, it says, if it is possible, As far as it depends on you, pointing the finger back at yourself, live at peace with everyone. And that really hit home for me. When we were four years into our marriage, I really had to look to myself because Adam and I were at each other all the time. I didn't know what was really going on with him. He was angry all the time. I felt like I was walking on eggshells around him. We... uh, Apparently, the Cabo thing didn't really, like, help our marriage (laughs) for two years to four years, um, getting away with each other, but it just came to a head. We were always kind of doing this contempt thing that I talked about earlier, just belittling and not understanding how to speak each other's languages and that kind of thing. And so what I would do as a result of that was I was withdrawing love from him and specifically sexual love from him because I didn't feel loved myself. I felt disrespected, and so in turn, I turned away from him. I would also stonewall him, meaning I wouldn't talk to him. I wouldn't communicate about what I was upset about. And he would, that was my way of just being like, well, I'm just not gonna talk to you, make you feel bad about it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that never worked, right? It just created this downward spiral to the point where we were on Anderson Island one weekend for a wedding and we were stuck on the island together because we were going to the wedding. We rented a house and we had our baby with us. So we had our, our first child at this point. And life was, was hard enough, but going onto this island with our daughter and trying to figure out how to talk to each other and communicate made it really tough. And we just got to a head. That, things came to a head that weekend. And I just told him, I, I don't love you anymore. I don't feel loved. I feel like you're always angry at me and I can't figure out what to do about that. I want out of this marriage, I'm done. I want a divorce, I told him that. And he said, that's not possible. I'm not gonna let you out of this divorce over that. Like, we need to talk through this. And we were stuck on an island and at a wedding, so it was in our face all weekend. (laughs) So we really had to talk about it. And uh, it was good, because the communication lines were finally open and I reached that bottom, rock bottom. And so he told me that the reason why I feel this way is because you're withholding, my, uh, you're withholding a need that I have and that's physical desire to be close with you. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, as far as it is up to me, then this is where I can change. 
And when I started giving him the physical needs that he needed, that he had, then our relationship just totally changed from there. And he started speaking my love language too. And speaking of love languages, two years later, I got the book, The Five Love Languages from Gary Chapman, and I was reading through it on the treadmill, and I'm like, okay, underlining and writing in the margins, all these things, and I'm like, he needs to read this. Oh, gosh, this is really good. But I finally figured out, oh, yeah, duh, his number one love language is physical touch, and I wasn't speaking that. Well, now that I am, no wonder why things are better, but he wasn't speaking mine yet. So for Valentine's Day that year, I'm like, all right, honey, here, you're gonna read this book. No, I'm not, I'm not your husband. <laughs> I ain't reading that. You can't tell me what to do. <laughs> As a controlling wife, I just took over. Yeah, you go, you're gonna read you this it. book. And uh, he did, and, and he started speaking my love language, which was at the time, gifts given. And uh, he started taking me out on dates and buying me things, and it made, filled my tank, and then I was filling his tank, and the whole thing started in a positive spiral going forward. And so we love that, uh, that we can now speak each other's languages. And that has changed over the years. So I re highly recommend taking that quiz. In fact, we were taking the quiz in a life group one year at Chris and Brian Johnson's house. And uh, it was really funny because mine has shifted. I had taken it and now I'm, I'm apparently physical touch is my number one love language is the same with Adam. And so they were like, get a room, you guys. Uh, like giving us a, a hard time about it. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. Um, but I want to say to you guys a couple of pretty strong truths for you ladies out there. Hopefully you'll learn from my mistakes, but that control can be unspoken. It doesn't have to be the Jezebel, like, I'm controlling wife out there. It can feel very like, I, like what I was doing. I was withdrawing. I wasn't talking. I was withholding. And that withholding of physical intimacy and, and withholding as number one love language was very manipulative. And it may have been subconscious at the time, but when it become a conscious thing and then I could do something about it, it really helped our marriage. So you have to be willing to do what you don't feel like doing in order to get the life you want. I'm also gonna be straight with you ladies on a whole nother topic because this is, a, this is something that I see a lot, especially with, with those of us who have children. So why is it that we're willing to do anything for our children, but not necessarily for our man? So why is it that we're willing to go out of our way to serve our children even when they are mistreating us? Like our kid's not nice to us, you know, that happens a lot. Yet we still feed them, we still cuddle them, we still kiss them goodnight, that kind of a thing. But if our husbands were to do that, we withhold and then restrict and don't want to do things for them that are nice. Is it a wonder that our husbands don't feel loved and as a result, we don't get love in return? I can always be doing a much better job in speaking Adam's love language, of course, but so far as it is up to me, I have the power to keep working on it. Hey, can we thank Jolene for her transparency? You know, that's just, that's just big. As you listen you know, to Jolene, don't get caught up in the examples. Sometimes people are like, well, that, and that doesn't apply to us, and here's our situation. The principles is what God wants us to follow. What does it look like when he says submission, a mutual submission, what does it look like for wives to submit to their husbands and to respect their husbands? And you contextualize as you talk back and forth because every couple is different. Uh, in fact, you know, ladies, um, I, I wanna make sure this is all, all very, very clear. Uh, sometimes uh, you think that the Bible or the church or people are against type A driven women. That's just furthest from the case. That's just not true at all. You know, uh, uh, we, are, we are always for how God has wired you. If you're a type A, driven, conquer the world kind of woman, that is exactly how you should be living, how you should be behaving. In fact, we model this as well, right? We hired, you know, a very driven person. And we hire women very driven. That doesn't give us license to say, well, then I'm not going to be humble or submissive in these other relationships. And the same thing with the guys. And ladies, I want you to understand, you have way more power in your words than you realize. You have so much power, and something happens when you get married. It, it just does. It, it, in fact, I cannot tell you how many guys I talk to where it comes to respect, that you have the power to make his day whenever you speak anything well about him in front of anybody else. If you say anything positive about him in front of anybody else, you know what he does? He becomes a proud peacock. And he's like, ooh, 
Yes, I feel uplifted. My woman just gave me this kudos in front of other people and it just uplifted me, made me feel so good. And conversely, it doesn't take much for you to say that makes them feel this big. And Caroline and I used to fight about this because she would be like, wait a minute, we're joking on a regular basis in the home where we joke with our certain group of friends and you know, I pick on you, you pick on me. It's just kind of this fun little banter back and forth. I said, yes, I don't know why, but when you do it in front of other people, it makes me feel like this. So call me a goofball at home, call me a goofball in my life group, but don't call me a goofball in front of other people. And I don't know why, but God gave you that power you know, in my life, and so it just means so much. Speaking of love languages, uh, when we were first marriages, married, uh, uh, we missed each other all the time. Uh, she would write notes. She was a note writer. That was impressive. You know, the things that she would say about how she loved and she appreciated me and cards and different things. And even in my lunch, I'd open up my napkin and it had words written on it, that kind of stuff. And I'd come home. She goes, hey, did you get what I wrote? And sometimes I didn't even read it. And I'd be like, yeah, it was great. <laughs> you know, because words of affirmation has never been my love language. And what I would do with her is I would clean the house. I would vacuum. I would try to make dinner. Not very well often, by the way. Um, I would make sure the things because I knew she had a hard day and she'd come home and she walks in the house and I'd be like, look, look what I did. And she goes, oh, you cleaned up. Thanks. And I'm like, why aren't you more appreciative of all the things that I'm trying to do for her? And what we tend to do is we tend to give what we most want to receive. And so all of a sudden when I realized that, I'm like, oh, because what meant more to her is when she walked in the house and I verbally told her, you know what, I love you. I think you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen today. I just appreciate. And when I said those things, she was just like glowing versus all the things that I was doing. And when she would actually have the house straightened or there would be a dinner ready or something like that, it was an act of service that I knew that she went out of her way when she was tired and I would come home going, wow, that meant so much more to me than you writing me notes. But we're all wired differently. And once we figure that out, it really helps us in how we can love and submit to what the other person needs or how they feel most love. Here's the other thing that I did oftentimes, and, and none of you guys are ever, I probably never do this like me, but I always kept a scorecard in my brain. <laughs> when she would do these things, then I would do these things. If she did these things, then I would do these things. But when she didn't do some of these things, then I would naturally withhold some of these things because she didn't deserve. I know it sounds awful as I say it, but that's how, how we found ourselves living until I realized, no, 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 whether she deserves it or earns it or not, my submission to Christ gives me the power and the ability to love her in spite of her and in spite of me. And so regardless of how I feel, so let's talk husbands a little bit more, you know, what this means of mutual submission, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For us, that means we are called to lead with active, not passive, love and sacrifice. So Ephesians 5, 25 and 26 for us men say, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Notice how his example, he gave his life for her. Talk about submission, to give, when you choose to say, I do, as we talked about last week, your relationship with Christ is first and she is number two. Not our dreams, our hobbies, our ambitions, that kind of stuff. It's together and now I am dying to myself in the same way that Christ died for me. And that's not easy. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. So two things stand out in this passage for husbands, which we could talk weeks on. But let me just quickly just mention, husbands, love your wives sacrificially sacrificially, as Christ loved the church, find out what her love language is. And I get it, when you go to work is where you feel most respected and valued off the time. And so we use that. We're like, well, I just feel more respected. I feel more valued when I'm working or in my hobby. Let me just remind you of a couple of truths. Number one, some people get paid to show you respect. And if they stopped working at your business, you might not get that anymore. Uh, secondly, none of those coworkers live with you. And they don't live with me either. So they get to see the whole picture, you know, not just one presentation of it. And so understand that maybe, just maybe, that your wife has also had a day when you come home and you've had a day. So two things that have helped me greatly is when Christ can bring this into my presence. How do I love sacrificially? Meaning beyond what I feel. I'm coming home. I've had a hard day. I've had a time tiring day. There's two things that have helped me. Number one, that I recognize enter and enter with an intentionality that she's going to want or need something. So enter, because if I'm willing to give all that I am in my work, why am I not willing to give all that I am in my home? 
And so as I walk in to say, okay, how can I engage? I know that she wants to talk. I know that she wants to, even if I'm done talking and my words are all used up, that I said, no, there's an opportunity to be able to do this. But the second thing I do, if Christ reminds me, is I, as I pull into the driveway, I say this almost every time, I pray a simple prayer. Lord, I need your help for whatever I'm about ready to walk into. Because I have no idea. You know, because when the kids were younger, you know, she would stay at home. That, now she's, you know, working half time, and so she's coming home. I have no idea if I'm walking into fires or different things that are there, if it's calm. I said, just give me your insight. Give me your understanding to, to enter and to love sacrificially, even if I'm tired and I need a break. And there's conversation. We can go in, in that direction, you know, for, for a, a long time, you know, because there's so much more to that. But uh, one of the things that I have learned uh, probably even more recently is this phrase, guys, it's gonna sound so foreign to so many of us. Um, one of the ways that we love our lives is to love her emotionally before we love her intellectually. And so the best illustration, yes, it's, 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 it's by far exaggerated, but it is right perfect with what we're talking about, is this illustration you're gonna see on the screen now. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop on. trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come oh. on, if you would just- Don't! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that kills me every single time. I watched that a hundred times, over and over and over. It is not about the nail. Obviously, it's an exaggerated version that there is this tendency for many men, I know this doesn't apply to everybody, that when something is expressed by our wives, we think our role is to fix it. And so the solution to what's being presented is to give the solutions. And the solution should come, but more often than not, that's not what most women want to hear first. The first thing they want to hear, and I've learned this through marriage counseling that Caroline and I have gone through, the first thing they want to hear is that you empathize with them and then get to the fix it. But we go right to the fix it that we don't empathize with the feelings. Now, I actually, even within the last six months, you know, when Caroline and I have, have gone to see a counselor, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I have struggled with Caroline is when she's mad at me. And so when she's upset at me, I think, I'm like, okay, the reason you're upset is because you don't have all the information. You're upset at me, but if you would understand why I did what I did, when I did, or how I did, then you would be less upset at me. So just let me educate you. Let me help you understand why I responded or did, which should make so much sense to you, and then you'll be less mad at me. Guess what? That never works. <laughs> Ever. Even when I'm right. It never works. Here's what I learned. The counselor even told this. He's like, you're never going to win. I was like, well, tell me how to win. He goes, here's how you win. I was like, because I'm a competitive. I need to win. So here's what he said. He said, even when she's mad at you, can you enter into how she's feeling? I said, what does that mean? And he says, he goes, what you do is you empathize as if it was happening to you. And I was like, well, that doesn't help much. So he says, okay, let's practice this. So she's upset at you. Can you just say, I'm sorry that I made you upset? And I said, that's it? He's like, yeah. He goes, and mean it. 
And he goes, you'll get to why you said what you said, when you said, and to help her understand. He goes, but watch. Her temperature will drop significantly because she'll immediately feel connected to you. And so I'm like, yeah, right. So I tried it. It works. (laughs) But yet I'm like a two-year-old. You know, because I'm fumbling through, like, I'm sorry you feel, oh, that's not the way to say it, you know, uh, you know, I'm sorry you misunderstood what I said, nope, that's not the way to say it. I just need to say that really must be hard, and I'm sorry that I caused that, I'm sorry that, I, that you're feeling this way, I'm sorry that whatever it is that you're going through, see, I'm not even saying it right now, you know, I'm learning through this, but I can tell you when I've done that, it is amazing how she has cried in some cases. In other cases, she just said, thank you for listening to me because I think I'm looking at a nail in her head and what it really is is she just wants to be heard. Then, after a period of time, then we can talk about the solutions and it has just changed. It has changed things. I'm just talking about this within the last few months. This has been something that I'm learning and I'm growing in as a way to love my spouse. The second thing, as the, the scriptures tell us, is to actively lead your wife and family spiritually. And I get it. It's hard. It's uncomfortable. We've never been modeled this before. Uh, But the facts are still the facts. The truth is, if if a man is leading spiritually, even their own lives, even their own spiritual lives in development, not even talking about their spouses, it'll impact the family 80% of the time. 80%. It's amazing the impact, men, that you have, that God has given you. And I understand, what do I do? I don't know how to do this. It was never modeled. Great. But just like I just told you what's hard for me, go on a journey. Here's some ways that you can practically, as of today, go from passive to active. Ready? Here's the first one. You decide to make church a commitment. You say, you don't wait for your, your, your wife to say, hey, are we going to church tomorrow? I'd like to go to church tomorrow. You say, we're going to church every time we can. I'm driving, we'll get there. And whether she goes or not, you're saying, I'm going anyway. Do you understand that one little active thing, what that will do in your relationship? By just saying, I'm not waiting for you to feel like you're dragging me. I'm gonna make the decision for us. This is gonna be a priority. For others of you, maybe, maybe a simple step is uh, we, there's a version Bible app and there's a verse a day. Maybe you read it and you just share that verse with your spouse. You don't have to be an expert or be a certain level of experience and understanding to be like, oh, I can, I can be active and not passive. Uh, maybe a third way would be you decide to say, you know what, I'm gonna get into a men's group because I know that I can learn from other men about what it means to be a father, a husband, you know, a worker, whatever it may be, or... Honey, why don't you and I intentionally make a priority to join a life group? Why don't we do this? Why don't we make it? And you lead that, it will affect her so greatly. Ladies, is that true? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, well, well, three of you are excited about that. That's okay. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely awesome. Uh, for, for others of you, maybe it's uh, uh, men, it's just saying, I'm going to start serving regularly. And you're like, well, I, don't, I can't lead a life group. I don't know anything about the Bible. You don't have to. There's other places of service. Did you know we have a place of service where every once in a while, if you're background checked, you can carry a gun? We have security. You know, you can be a part of that. You're like, really, in a church? Yes. You know, you can work in the tech area. There's facilities. There's finances. There's all these other areas that you could be involved in serving as well as the kids and the youth ministry. Maybe you make a choice financially to start putting God first in your resources. One of the biggest things I hear from ladies is, I want to give, but my husband won't let me. Why don't you lead? See what God does. Or maybe the biggest one, Pray. Those couples that pray together stay together. That's just a known fact. And I understand it's, it's awkward, but sometimes the only thing you need to do is just, hey, we're gonna pray together, and you're like, I don't even know what to do. So just hold each other's hands and say, when I squeeze, we're done. You know, and just be like, we're gonna, that's how we're gonna start. You've moved from passive. Do you see these little things? All of these things have just taken a natural passivity, and now you're more active and then you grow from there. But these are great starting points. Again, Ephesians chapter five, verse 33 says, so again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. In fact, if you've already read the five love languages, uh, another book that would be helpful on this specific topic is love and respect. It's a great book to, to dialogue with your spouse and what that looks like and see which applies you know, to which spouse, because I know we're generalizing, and you see, where can I grow? That's the whole point. What is God wanting you to hear today so that you walk out of here a little different? Mm-hmm. You know, Adam and I have been coming here 10 years, and about three years in, we start, joined a life group, made a commitment to that, and from there, he's really stepped up spiritually to lead the home, and 
that now has turned into us waking up at 5 a.m. every morning on his leading to read the Bible through a year together. Now we're on our, our third year, actually, doing that. And so I really appreciate that about him because he's very habit-driven and loves to do that with me, and we like quality time together, too. So, you guys, what is your guys' next step? For you as the wife, how will you love your husband differently this week? And for the husband, how will you love your wife differently this week? For those of you without a spouse or a significant other, maybe it's someone else in your life you, that's on your heart right now that you want to reach out to and, and love them this week in a different way. As we started, um, don't hear for your spouse and don't hear for, well, I don't agree with that one part. What do you sense that God's leading you to? All of us have areas to grow. So what is the one thing that God is calling you to do? In fact, I'm gonna ask uh, some of you to do something that may be a little bit uncomfortable, but if you are willing and you are here with your spouse, I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. I'm just gonna ask you to hold their hand. So hold their hand and let's go into this time of prayer. Jesus, thank you so much for leading, guiding, and directing. We want you to be the center. Father, left up to ourselves, uh, we are very selfish, centered people. And Father, I know uh, how that, that rears its ugly head in my own marriage as I think about me before we and before you. And so, Father, I pray that you would lead, guide, and direct our steps. We just want to honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.